We need transparency more than ever when we are talking about election integrity. It's one of the rights that people fought and died for, and it should be taken care of, and we should be talking about all of the integrity that goes with an election, and we are not. It's concerning because so many of our leaders are failing to do their job. Keeping our republic is on the line, and it requires patriots with great passion, dedication, and eternal vigilance to preserve our freedoms. Jenny Beth Martin is the co-founder of Tea Party Patriots. She is an author, a filmmaker, and one of Time Magazine's most influential people in the world. But the title she is most proud of is mom to her boy-girl twins. She has been at the forefront, fighting to protect America's core principles for more than a decade. Welcome to The Jenny Beth Show. Charlie Spurt, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me. I look forward to our conversation. I do too. I'm so excited to have you. We go back so long working on elections, really since both of us moved to Cherokee County, Georgia. And um, you have a lot of experience with election integrity related issues personally that I want to talk about today. And then also you're, you're part of this, the Georgia Freedom Caucus. We interviewed um, Andy Roth before. And I just think it's really important that you talk about what you're doing in, in Georgia and how you're trying to make a difference with conservative values. Absolutely. The election integrity is very important to all of us. And back in 20, 20, 2004, when uh, I started running, we had an election and it was the primary election. There were two other people in it, two of us came out as uh, the top winners. Correct. Thank you. The top vote contenders or whatever. Yes. So we had to run in a runoff. During the runoff, there was an incident in Cherokee County. Uh, there was actually a shooting. And my opponent claimed that it kept people from going to vote. She took it to a court. The judge over turned the election. Which you had won by four votes. Four, four whole, votes. Four votes. So that's why it's important for everyone to go and cast their ballot. After that, I had to run all over again and start from scratch, knocking doors. That particular election probably knocked on 15,000 plus doors. So we had the runoff. And the second time I won, I had 132 votes beating her because of all of the hoopla of going through a court system, overturning my election, starting from scratch again. And I think the people of the community were very upset because it was meant more taxpayer dollars that we were spending on election integrity, which of course is important. It, it is important. Um, and what, what we, what I was in the courtroom as you went through all of that. I was there every single day because we'd gone door to door together every single day before that. Um, but what, what I learned during that time, and one of the things that was so important is that your opponent brought forward, you won by four votes, and she brought forward like 12 or 20 people who were witnesses who said they had some sort of problem voting. And she was not in any way contending that there was fraud. So there was no, no evidence of fraud. That wasn't what the claim was. But in Georgia, I think the code is OCGA 21-2-522. Maybe wrong, but I think that's what it is. It says that an election may be contested due to fraud, misconduct, or irregularities that um, cast doubt on the outcome of the election. And that's, she was looking at irregularities that cast a doubt on the outcome of the election. And she brought forward 12 or 20 people, but 12 is greater than four. And they all said that they had problems. And the judge wouldn't let them tell how they would have voted. So they could have voted for you, but that was irrelevant. It was just that they had a problem voting. And it was more than the margin of vote difference between the two races. And so he overturned the election according to state law. And now we have people in Georgia who are indicted for challenging an election and under the same thing that happened to you. It's just crazy. And I think that it, it's, it is the same, it's applying the same law and it's legal to contest an election. We have to remember now we are living under a two justice system and it is, um, I guess I would consider it's 
Republicans against Democrats, the left or the right, and they are challenging those types of things in the court system, which I believe is um, bogus. It is a witch hunt. All those sorts of things, but yet nothing's being done about that particular election, and we're still talking 2020. Right. And we're about to take on the 2024 election, and it is very disconcerting because there are still many people that are concerned about how their vote and how it will be counted. Are we going to have fair and honest elections? And we have to sort that out immediately. That's right. And and there were a lot of problems in Georgia and, and other states around the country. Um, we've worked to make sure that we've got poll watchers in place in Georgia, and we urge everyone to step up and actually be a poll wa worker to work the poll rather than being a poll watcher. But if they can't work it, then be a poll watcher um, to get involved. But there, there are broader issues, like in Georgia, we've got a bit of a problem right now with we, which we're talking about with the United States Postal Service and the the delivery because they're, they've changed. What all has gone on with that? You know that better than me. Explain that. It is my understanding that they wanted to build a new facility and they have placed it in Palmetto. Palmetto is in the airport south area of um, Fulton County. It has been built. They've put all the equipment inside that building. However, nothing is working. At this point, it is my understanding that they are going to shut that down for now because if you can't have mail that is processed in a timely manner, how are we ever going to get absentee ballots through the mail process? Yeah, it's very, very concerning. And it's good news to know that they're doing something to revert back to the old system or to make sure that mail is processing properly. And then we've got to make sure people know how to deal with it, especially in Georgia, that there is an, an issue. So they know how to, that there are alternative methods to return their absentee ballot if they have to vote absentee or to go vote early. We have three weeks of early voting in Georgia. That's correct. I mean, I remember the days when there was 45 days of early voting. And it was, I was concerned at that time because the Constitution said you're supposed to have one day of voting. And if it means giving everyone a holiday, that's what we should go back to so that we know exactly who is voting instead of the whole absentee process or having excuses of why you are not going to show up at the poll in person. I'm all about in-person voting. So, I mean, we continue to work on those things at the state level. But we opened the Pandora's box when we started the boxes in various locations, drop boxes. Mm -hmm. And to me, a drop box all these years was called the mailbox. Right. And so now we have all these drop boxes. The good news is that at least they're under surveillance now with cameras. And so we actually know how many people are coming in there and dropping their ballots off. Me personally, I am still against the drop boxes, but I'm only one in a, maybe a handful at the Capitol. Um, and then at the at the Capitol this past legislative session, there were changes to election law. What 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 happened with that? Everyone has been discussing this for years of what they would like to see. One of them was getting rid of the QR code because no one really understood what did it say. You can't t test it to know what it states on that QR code. We also made the decision to put a watermark on paper. That was another one. Uh, request from a lot of Board of Elections and, uh, and people in the community because they were concerned once again about their ballot. So those are a couple of things that we have done. We also said that they, any citizen who had a concern about the election, that they would have the ability to, whether it's a lawsuit or challenge it themselves, which is also a good thing because I'm sure there would have been a lot of other people that would have liked to um, challenged um, their, that particular box or the boxes that everybody brought in. So we're moving in the right direction. The bad news is the, what we have done this year and what the governor has signed does not become effective until 2026. Wow. So we still have to work through the system that, that we had in 2022 right, right now. That not, is correct. Which is an improvement over 2020, but not as good as what it will be in a couple years from now. That's right. 
Okay, now you're part of the Georgia Freedom Caucus, which is part of the overall State Freedom Caucus network. What, what, what do you do with that? And, how, and explain what your role is and how that is helpful. We started a State Freedom Caucus. We were the, the very first state that made the decision to have a network and, excuse me, a caucus. It started because we needed to lean farther right and possibly get people that are kind of middle of the road Republicans to maybe think about their vote more often um, before voting. So the- Legislators, not just voters. Correct, but, sorry, right, yes, right. it was legislators. Um, the Freedom Caucus started in 2021. I was a founding member of the Freedom Caucus, and it has worked well in some instances. We have a long ways to go. We are very small. But our main re purpose is to drive other legislators to think in terms of the four pillars that we go by before casting a vote. One is, does it grow government? Does it raise taxes? Does it increase regulation? And does it infringe on personal liberties? Those things that after I read a bill, I put in, in a box to, to consider how any of those relate to those four pillars. But I also add a fifth pillar for myself, and that is what is the proper role of government? We are so beyond the proper role of government right now, whether it's the state of Georgia across the country. Technically, the Constitution told us it was to protect, defend, and preserve. Nothing else, nothing more. To protect us, military, police force, sheriffs, you name it, to protect us, defend, all those sorts of things. But now we are spending money at a state level that is unbelievable for things that should have never been paid for. So we are trying to move other Republican legislators to think in those terms instead of giving every single dollar of new revenue that comes in to add it to some new program. And um, are you reading bills? Um, what? How? How does it function? Like when you're in when you're in session? Sure, we have a director of the State Freedom Caucus, and we have a policy director. The gentleman that is the policy director reads every single bill. Doesn't matter whether it's going to a committee or not. It's just whatever bill is around, he starts reading it. I only read the bills that are coming to the floor for a House vote and or the bills that are in my committees. There are 48 plus committees in the House and it's very difficult to prepare for all 48 committees. So I only focus on my own committees. Then the second step is if it is coming to the floor for a vote, I make sure I reread the bill, make sure that there have been no changes, but on the same hand, the policy director and I are communicating. He takes a summary of the bill and he tells me exactly what is in there. He gives the pros and the cons and he takes the four pillars and if it fits into any of those pillars, he said, this is a no vote. However, I want you to understand, it doesn't mean that's how I am going to vote. It is his suggestion of how we make our the four pillars. There are occasions that that does not work, and there are also occasions that he and I get into a discussion of what I believe of why it should be voted on or why it should be a no. And is that working well for you? Because you were a state legislator before there was a state freedom caucus, and now you're one with it. How do you think it helps support the role of a legislator? Back in the days when I served from 05 to 2012, we did have a group very similar to the Georgia Freedom Caucus, and at the time it was called the 216 Club, and it was only because it was the room that we met in. Room so, 216. That's exactly right. We read those bills as a group. We had lively debate, but we did a negative one and a positive one, but with five different pillars. So we would discuss those. We would then rate them, and it was still up to each individual of how they needed to vote, whether it was the way it fit into your district or the way you believed in what the bill was saying. And so the Georgia Freedom Caucus is almost identical to what we did back in 20. 
uh, 12 when we rated all of those bills. It does work. It helps immensely. We haven't convinced everyone of those four pillars, and there are this year that there were a few legislators that came and asked me how I was voting. I explained the bill, why I was voting the way I was. And so it kind of helped them. It didn't mean that they were voting the same way I was, but at least they understood really what the Georgia Freedom Caucus was representing. Um, and, and was that a problem before? Did they not understand what you were representing? And it seems to me like one of the, the things that with what you're describing and maybe the House Freedom Caucus does the same thing, but I haven't seen it explained so succinctly. When you just when you say these are the four things we're evaluating each bill on, or five things, it it, it, it provides a lot of clarity for how you're going to be voting. It does. It helps immensely. We have a white paper that um, our policy director gives to me and a couple of other people during the uh, the day before or either that morning so that we can have real clarity while I am reading my own bill. Because there are too many people in the House that do not read the bills. They have no idea what is in the bill. They go and vote one way or the other. And then I, on occasion, question, why did you vote for that? Or they'll come in over to me and say, well, why'd you vote no? And then I give them, them a very clear, concise reason why I voted no, and that's why they should have voted no as well. <laughs> <laughs> that hasn't worked yet. But, you know, more and more people are understanding what the Freedom Caucus represents. That, I think that's good. And um, it, it, it's small right now. Hopefully it grows in the, the coming years. That's our plan. Yesterday, I was on a two-hour conference call with our Freedom Caucus to talk about those things, a long-term, short-term strategy. We're kind of in a down period now because school is about to end. Everybody's involved in graduation, trying to get people to go and do their voting for the primary election. But once that's over, it's going to give us about 60 days to refresh and renew, start hard again in August. So we can start talking about what exactly is our mission? What is it that we want to accomplish come January? What is it do we want to share with the rest of our legislators? Do we want to share our white papers with them, everybody, or just the ones that are more interested in why we vote the way we do? So those are the things um, that we are discussing now because nothing would be more important than to grow. When you have a strong group of individuals in the House of 180 of us or 102 Republicans, you may then be able to sway everybody to vote the best way possible to represent the state of Georgia. That's, I think, really important because we need more conservative legislation in a red state. And it seems like a problem that many red states are actually having. They, they are a red state, but then oftentimes the legislation that's passing isn't as conservative as you would think would come out of a red state. That's, that's correct. People, I find that all of my friends that I sit with in the House chamber are all good people, but they're not considering the, the long-term outcomes when they pass a bill. They don't know what the unintended consequences are, and we're constantly going back the next session to put a Band-Aid on the unintended consequences. We have to have another bill to fix that unintended consequences. And across the state right now, there are 11 Freedom Caucuses. and they oh, Across the country? Across the country. Okay. Sorry, across That's the okay. country. And they are having just as many problems as we are. They have more numbers in their caucus, but the probably more moderate people that are in their chambers uh, don't want their uh, input. They don't want to cause waves because they don't want the people to know what is really going on under that gold dome, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, right. as most people don't. Um, they think they are insulated. And they don't have to worry about the people that are outside that you were supposed to be representing and who voted you in office. Right. Places like Idaho, I believe it is, that they were... It's funny because that's exactly what I was thinking about. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yes. They actually, the Speaker of their house, 
removed all of their furniture so they couldn't even have any kind of meeting in their own office. Now, that guy did not vote for those legislators. It was their districts that right. voted, and obviously they want them in that seat. So for someone to cut them out is absolutely ludicrous, exactly what they did to Senator Colton Moore when right here in Georgia, the Republican caucus in the Senate voted to remove him from the caucus because they didn't want him causing them issues in their district when he was out there touting what exactly was going on with their votes. And speaking of Colton Moore and uh, some of the things that expose the differences that you guys do versus others um, in, in the state legislature, you and I and Colton spoke at a press conference last summer, late summer, after the indictments in Georgia, and you guys were pushing for the impeachment of Fannie Willis, or at least to bring the a potential articles of impeachment to debate it in, in the chambers. And uh, there were not really any other members of the House standing with you, or the Senate standing with him. Why is that? One, they don't want to get involved. One, they don't believe that there was any fraud. So there was no reason to uh, do anything against former President Trump. We started a letter in August of last year and asked our uh, House members and Senate members to sign on so that we could start a process against Fannie Willis. Not one person signed on. They were sent to the governor. It was sent to the attorney general. And we asked all of our House members. No one wanted to participate. I mean, who knows why? Everybody has their own reason. They don't want to be seen in the limelight trying to cause trouble. This is why we have been elected, not to sit on the sideline. I then filed a resolution for impeachment of Fannie Willis because it has the impeachment comes from the House side and then the Senate must do the investigation. So, but unfortunately, uh, no, one would want it, no one wanted to hear my resolution um, in the House because they didn't want the limelight to be shining on them of reasons why they weren't taking this up. So there I sat all by myself with the articles of impeachment and now look where we are and Fannie Willis being um, investigated in all sorts of ways, you would think one would say, I wonder why we didn't impeach her when we could. Right. And what you were doing in last, late last summer after the indictments in Georgia came out, and for those who are not aware, the indictments included President Trump, along with people who were electors in Georgia and attorneys and people who worked for him in the White House and, and others that some of them seem rather random from other parts of the country who wound up being indicted um, for challenging an election, which is legal in Georgia and happened to you and an election was actually overturned of your election. What you're trying to do is beyond just what's happening to President Trump and those who are indicted. It, it is protecting the integrity of the entire, of the entire system. All of those people, whether they're Republican or Democrat, they may be in the same boat at some point and need to challenge an election. There may be true irregularities that happen where they need they need need the court to take a look at what happened and determine is it enough that it it, it creates um, and casts doubt on the outcome of the election and should should the election be overturned or not. But when we when we turn legal activity into crimes, it it really creates a problem for the entire system. It does indeed. Certainly, there were people like Al Gore, Hillary Clinton, Stacey Abrams said exactly the same thing right. that President Trump said, that it was, there was issues with the election. There was nothing done to them because they called people out on the, the election. So to me, this is once again the double standards that we are living under right now. We are also talking about our First Amendment right. All they did was state that there were some misgivings uh, about the election. I don't know that they ever used the word fraud. They were just expressing themselves to the public that they had grave concern about the election process. 
So if we are now looking at what they are doing to those people, former President Trump and the 18 other people that were indicted as well, then we all should be concerned because at any time someone could knock on our door and accuse us of anything and we could go the same route. That's exactly right. Um, so your letter was calling for a special session of the legislature to look into whether an impeachment article should even be inter introduced or not. So it was a special session and it requires a supermajority or the act of a governor to have a special session in Georgia. And then during the session, they didn't want to hear anything about it. it, it and towards the end of the session, they were doing some investigations in the, the Senate into uh, Fannie Willis and her, her behavior because uh, Michael Roman, who is one of the people who's been indicted, and his attorney and then others afterwards ha have, have raised legitimate concerns about uh, whether there were conflicts of interest in, with what she did. And in now the appeals court is going to hear, it just seems like there's always this desire to just sort of kick the can. It's like a hot potato. It's not even kicking the can down the road. It's like, I don't want to touch it. Let me throw it away to, to someone else because nobody wants the responsibility of having to deal with it if it's in their hand. But you were willing to. Indeed. Going back to the whole election integrity part of it, if we don't stand up, and take a strong stand against these types of things, what's gonna happen in the future? I mean, look what we're fighting now and what may happen in November, we have no idea. I mean, I know every day it seems like we are talking to more people in the district and they are still very concerned of how their vote will be counted, whether it's gonna go in a box and they'll, it'll never be seen. We need transparency more than ever when we are talking about election integrity. It's one of the rights that people fought and died for. Men and women went out and are protecting the freedoms of this country. And that is one of the freedoms that we fought for, for the ability to go out and vote. And it should be taken care of. And we should be talking about all of the integrity that goes with an election. And we are not. And that's, that is it's concerning because so many of our leaders are failing to do their job. It's true. And, and leadership isn't fun sometimes. Like, you have to make the tough decisions. Sometimes you have to do things that your friends don't like because you're doing what's right, or you're trying to get people to follow, or you're, you know it's what is expected of you. And, and it's tough. Sometimes it's really tough. And when you do that, all of the attention, and there's positive attention, of course, but also negative attention zeroes in on you and you start taking a lot of, a lot of flack for it. And you and Colton experienced that last summer. We certainly have. There's a lot of arrows that are thrown for sure. You have to be strong in who you are and you have to be strong in what you believe because when you take on those types of people, you know that at some point there could be consequences. You never know. I have to say from the House side, uh, they have not removed me from the caucus. Right. They, that would be, to me, one of, a huge mistake, removing you from your own caucus. It brings even more highlight to someone that has removed Colton Moore from his caucus. It puts them all in a bad light because they have now taken action against one of their own. He stands alone in the Senate all the time. I have to applaud him. He is extremely outspoken and he stands upright every single day. Doesn't matter how many arrows he's taken. And I just applaud and appreciate him for what he is doing from the Senate side. And he stands with me from the House side and we together continue to hold each other up. Um, we just enjoy each other's company, and we know it's a difficult task, but someone has to do it, because if not, it, things will remain the same. That, that is correct. Now, when I want to, you remember how you just said it, you're previously, so um, you were elected from 2004, you were elected in 2004 and began in 2005, and stayed in office through the end of 2012, and you lost an election, and then you went back and ran again later, which must have been a, not a fun decision for you to make because you knew the positives and the negatives of it, but you still did that, and I'm glad that you did. Um, 
But back then, you met in room 216, and I'm not saying that the current speaker or the current House leadership had anything to do with this, but didn't you guys get kicked out of a room in, in, the, um, in the House? We did. Um, we used room 216, and there was a legislator that wanted a bill to come to the House floor to pass, and hopefully to pass, and it was about tax cuts. The Speaker of the House at the time, uh, they made a deal, and the deal was at uh, you give up the 216 Club and move on, and I will let your bill come to the House floor for a vote. So there were many that scattered because they did not want to be associated any longer with the 216. So there were a probably, at the time, maybe two handfuls, about 10 people that stuck to it where we still met every single morning to discuss the bills that were coming to the House floor mm -hmm. for a vote. But again, that dwindled as well because one, people didn't have the time to put together, uh, the, read all the bills that we were gonna discuss. They didn't want the leadership to know they were still part of it because everybody, a lot of people at the Capitol wanna be in the inner circle. And if you are outside of the inner circle and you have been told not to do something, and then you continue to do it, you are going to be excommunicated. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. So and, and in Idaho, they're really finding that out. They are. I mean, it's horrible. And the leadership must remember that we were voted by our district. There is not one person under the gold dome that votes for me. But I do vote for them. One is like the governor, lieutenant governor, those people. And also, we have to vote for the Speaker of the House. So those are the votes that I cast. They don't vote for me, so I should be standing for my community and my district and my county to know exactly what they want, not what the people in the Gold Dome want. And, and you do that well. And you, you've gone door to door to get elected. Um, I think a lot of the, the others in the Capitol haven't done that, so they haven't had those face-to-face uh, -face conversations with, with the constituents the same way that, that you have. Not that they're not having conversations, but at the door is much different than seeing someone in the grocery store doing a town hall meeting. And then you also are very involved with town hall meetings and updating your constituents and staying, staying in touch and listening to them. I do. It's very important once you are elected you need to let everyone know what is going on at the Capitol. So having a town hall meeting once a week or monthly for sure, and then having going into districts to meet with HOAs, just giving you the ability to have time to talk. I belong to civic organizations and they proudly let me speak on oh, what's going on. And it's not to talk about whether it's right or wrong or good or bad, it's just what this is very informational. And I think that is important so that your constituents know who you are and what you were doing for them. I put things in three silos as a state legislator. One is by constitution, Georgia constitution, we must pass a budget. Number two is to pass or repeal laws. And number three is constituent services. And the constituent services is where you are reaching out to your community, where people come and meet you so that they know that you are part of their community, whether you are belong to civic organizations or the Chamber of Commerce or your church and Sunday school. These are all important things if you are going to be elected and remain elected. No one wants you to go into a box once you are elected and not see you or hear from you. Right. So I put out a newsletter on a weekly basis. I do my own handheld videos so that I can tell people about a bill. And we know that everything has to be done in short clips. So, I mean, they last for 45 seconds just so you can get a general sense of it. And if you need to call and talk to me about a bill, I, I gladly pick up that telephone call. I tell people all the time, it's a lot easier to vote no than it is yes, because you can justify your no a lot easier than you can justify your yes. Well, it's elaborate on that. So the budget, all right? We have a big budget and a little budget. Um, our little budget, which is called a supplemental budget, um, we do that in March. The, uh, this year, and then we um, vote for a the large budget, which is for the budget for 2025. 
I am the only no vote. It's tough being the only no vote um, on many occasions, but if we stop funding certain things, for instance, the DA's office, they wouldn't be able to exist. But we keep funding those kinds of things. And then another thing is that we give raises to everybody who is in government, no evaluation, no anything, but everybody across the board gets a raise. Now, if you don't, if the budget were never to pass, we could stop a whole lot of stuff. But we also have to keep in mind people continue to vote for the budget because they have a little piece in their district or mm -hmm. a getting a new health care center or a new technical school. Things that go into your, your district, they want to vote for it. So, but I am a no vote. And when that's when I'm talking about it's easier to justify your no. I know there's a lot of other good things in a bill. Um, to take care of maybe the elderly or a child that has a particular disease. But that is all part of the big budget, and I can't vote for a lot of the bad stuff when there is also good stuff. Transportation is one. Sure, we just did $2 billion worth for transportation, but I voted no on our budget because we need transportation, but there were too many bad things in the bill that I didn't believe in. I'm glad that you're willing to, to do that. And it winds up being really tough to explain why why do you keep funding the, the DA's office who's who's creating a two tiered system of justice or or other issues that, that may exist that that people are are voting for. It it just it, it I think it's harder to justify some of it because there's so many bad things that wind up getting approved. That's true. There are so many things that you probably don't know. As a taxpayer, what we are funding, it's astounding. And when I tell people, they, they, their eyes just become really big and they go, really? That is unbelievable. Why are we funding that? Because somebody asked for it and now we're going to give them the money to take back to their districts so they can say they did a great thing. It's crazy. It's just crazy. It's so frustrating. And you and I have complained about those kind of issues um, for a long, for a long, <laughs> long time. Um, you moved here. Prior to being here, you were in Hong Kong, weren't you? That's correct. And uh, you and your husband were there when it changed from um, English control to, to Chinese control. That's right. And weren't you in the League of Women, were you the president of the League of Women Voters? I was. I was the president of the League of Women Voters in Hong Kong, but it was very different um, con considering League of Women Voters here in the States. Over in Hong Kong, we would have spe speakers that would come to our meetings. It could have been Newt Gingrich at the time. It could have been the, uh, Patton was his name at the, at the time when I was there, but he would come and speak. And when we would meet, we would talk about various topics from everyone's country and how it was good, how it was bad, what they would do to change if they had been duly elected. So it was a great, process to learn and prepare for when I came back to the States to know exactly what my mission was, what my God-given purpose was to get involved in the political world. Over in Hong Kong, things were very different, of course, being under British rule. It seemed like everything was uh, free, like America has been in the past, changing a bit. But for that time, the British uh, I think it was his prime minister. I can't remember if he... And so it was terrific. I mean, they had the American Club, which I think they still have the American Club. And in 1998, when the Chinese, after their 100 years that had given to the British, they, we watched the Britannia with Prince Charles leave the harbor on his yacht and watched the military of China move in in the back door to be quietly held in place for supposedly another 50 years. China was not supposed to come and let Hong Kong remain their own country, their own political system. But as we know now, that did not happen. 50 years did not happen. It was more like 20 or 25 years, if I think that's correct. So coming back to the States after that was um, set my course for the political realm. And if somebody is thinking of running for office, what would you 
recommend to Don't them. do it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. But no. if they, they feel like they're, they, they're being called to do that or, or they think they can really make a difference, what are, what's the kind of advice that you give to people who, who ask you about it? Sure. One of my favorite quotes these days is, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And that is true for anything. And if you really want to make change, you have to be on the inside, which is why I ran again in 2019. So I do tell people that, number one, be sure that you understand that you are giving up a lot, especially family, and that your spouse or your family has to be part of it because it is a rough road when you want to run for office. Number two is if you are planning a run for office, say, two years from now, Start planning. Start joining your civic organizations. Make sure that you're out front at the chamber events, making sure that you are attending a church and going to Sunday school and any and everything else to be involved in your community. Become a political activist as well. Start going to your meetings at the Cherokee County Republican Party or any other organizations that may have politics so that you know what is going on so that you can intelligently talk about issues. That would be start it now and start early. Be prepared in 18 months if you are going to run for office to know exactly what you want to say and what you plan to do and why you're running for the office. Don't just tell me that you're running because I've always wanted to do this. <laughs> this is not an answer for me. May it be, it should be some kind of driven reason like illegal immigration. There is a gentleman that's running for office right now, and one of his family members was actually murdered by an illegal. That's what's motivated him to run. Find an issue. Stick to two or three issues. Be prepared for anything and be knowledgeable. You want more than anything to have name recognition in the community by the time you're ready to step in and run for public office. That's really good advice. And also, you can't take any of that for granted, right? Because even if you have a lot of name recognition or you know how to respond, campaigns are very wind up being being very unpredictable. Unpredictable one and number two is always costly. But number three, you always have to have a really good campaign manager like Jenny Beth Martin. <laughs> <laughs> she was my campaign manager for two terms. We won, as you can tell, because I'm sitting here now. And without someone that is a strong believer in you and what you are doing, and your campaign, uh, you really can't get a lot done because you need a strong, strong person that has been involved in the community and political activism just as much as you as the candidate. And I, I think when, it, when you're thinking of that, um, oftentimes, especially in a local campaign, the campaign manager winds up being someone who's local, and I was just a volunteer, um, but, you and that person and your spouse all have to have very thick skin. You can't let things, you can't take it personally. Even though it's very personal, you have to be able to just go, it's just a campaign and we have to just keep plowing through and almost put blinders on. You do. You cannot, and I made this promise to myself and to my husband that if there was anything that upset me, that I was not going to cry in public, I would go home and cry. If you were angry about something and you were about to write it down and put it in an email or any other thing <laughs> in writing, go home, sleep on right. it, and then delete. Those kinds of things that you have to learn and you do have to grow a thick skin. And I don't believe that it's anything personal against you as a, a, an individual, right. but it's really the policy or the issue that they are so passionate about. Right. I am very passionate about a lot of issues. I am very black and white. But there is a lot of people that's in between, and they want to have those conversations. And you have to have, you can agree to disagree in a, a respectful manner, and you don't have to take everything personally because you can't, because you would spend a lot of time in the bathroom crying. Right, or uh, getting really angry and doing foolish things. Stupid things, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that's really good advice that, that you're that you laid out there, and people should listen to it. And we need more people who truly are conservative to step up and run run for office. We do. I would love to see many more conservatives 
When you talk about conservatism, though, everybody's definition is very different. And the only way you're going to actually know if someone is conservative, you can say anything on the campaign trail until you have to cast those ballots on the screen where it's either green or red. You then find out how conservative someone is. Many of my colleagues call themselves conservatives, but when I see their vote, I beg to differ on, on those issues for sure. Yeah, and it, it, I'm sure that I would <laughs> differ with him as well. But we see the same thing happening in, in the House uh, and the Senate on Capitol Hill. The things that um, seem, that I think should be no-brainer votes for people who are Republican, it, it, it isn't. They, they just, they have a different definition or they're looking at a different calculus. That's correct, and I think that's why we have a pillar, those four pillars, so that you can decide and think about the other votes that you must make. And we don't get involved in some issues so that we are not voting yes or no. It's like a neutral. Um, you need to vote however you think you can you need to. Again, I want to repeat that they are not telling me how to vote. I make that decision on my own. But you do need to understand the entirety of of the four pillars and how we need to get back to the freedoms and liberties that we have so grown to cherish. And right. now we have moved so far away from those freedoms and liberties. And that is a concern that all of us as not only Georgians, but across America, that we should be concerned about our freedom and liberties being taken away. So um, if you were giving final ad advice to either legislators or to voters, what, what, what would be the final things you would say? Number one would be read the bill. Number two, give it serious consideration and put those four pillars in front of you so that we are not giving away the, the, all of the money that we bring in as new revenue. Make sure that you cautiously and carefully consider before voting and how it's going to affect other people in the community and in our state. I try to vote not so much on individual bills that will affect one or two people or maybe a dozen people, but how it affects everybody across the state of Georgia. We are so used to voting for winners and losers tax exemptions for certain companies, but we don't give it to these other companies. Why is that? So if we're voting for something, everyone should see the same benefit. So I would suggest if you plan on voting, do all of those things first so that you understand that every vote and every bill that becomes a law takes someone's right away, whether you agree with it or not. That is very good advice. Well, Charlie Spurd, thank you so much for being with me today and for being such a strong conservative in Georgia. Thank you, Jenny Bath. It was great to be part of this for sure. And our relationship has grown exponentially through the years and always look forward to sitting down and chatting with you. The Jenny Beth Show is hosted by Jenny Beth Martin, produced by Kevin Mooneyhan, and directed by Luke Livingston. The Jenny Beth Show is a production of Tea Party Patriots Action. For more information, visit TeaPartyPatriots.org. If you like this episode, let me know by hitting the like button or leaving a comment or a five-star review. And if you want to be the first to know every time we drop a new episode, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications for whichever platform you're listening on. If you do these simple things, it will help the podcast grow, and I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much.